Good evening and welcome to our program. I'm Stan Adams with the Word and Sword TV broadcast brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ, meeting at 656 St. James Church Road in Newton, North Carolina. Awfully glad you've come to, be, uh, to watch us this evening. You could return to a number of places, but we are studying a very important subject, a subject that genders a whole lot of interest, and we had a lot of calls on our last program about this subject, and we urge you to call in tonight also. We are glad that you are here. We thank you again for your presence. This show is uh, as much yours as it is ours. And we, uh, if you would like to call in with the Bible question, uh, we will do our best to give you a book, chapter, and verse answer. The number is 828-485-5555. And the operators are standing by now. If you'd like to call in in advance and get your uh, question in line, we would certainly be able to deal with that as the, as the program goes on. Uh, call in also if you have a request, if you'd like to study the Bible in your home by, by a correspondence course. Uh, we have two of those that we can uh, make you aware of. Uh, you can ask for a copy of this presentation or other presentations we've had. And you can ask for a free tract. If you would like a tract on the Holy Spirit in tongues, uh, please let us know and we can get you some of those if you would like a copy of the, what, is, what does the Bible say about the Holy Spirit and the gift of tongues. And uh, we can have those available to you. Be glad to mail those to you free of charge again. Uh, as you know, if you've been watching the program very long, there is no charge for anything that we offer on this program. This program is supported fully by the Newton Church of Christ. And uh, been doing, they've been doing this for oh, over 30 years now. So. Uh, keep that in mind, if you will, and continue to watch us. We appreciate so much uh, you come, uh, letting us come into your home. Uh, you can get some free Bible study aids if you want to go to www.wordandsword.com. And you can call again tonight with your question, and uh, we will give you a book, chapter, and verse answer. And if we can't do that, we will make sure that we get your information and that we answer your question. Your time and your attention to this program is very important. And your questions are very important. And here's the information that we just went over. And again, the phone number is 828-485-5555. And again, the program is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ that assembles at 656 St. James Church Road in Newton. Their service times are at 9.30 and at 11 o'clock. And Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock. And also, uh, if you would like to contact the Newton Church of Christ by uh, email, just go to contact at Word and Sword. That's contact at wordandsword.com. And uh, you can notify them uh, by that venue. You can also do it by phone by calling the building at 828-465-3009. Or you can do it by mail. If you just want to just send us, send us a letter, then you can go to P.O. Box 893, Newton, North Carolina, 28658. Again, the website is www.wordandsword.com. Notice that and is spelled out. And uh, avail yourself of that opportunity there. If you have uh, computer savvy, you can go and uh, go on Facebook at www.facebook.com slash wordandsword. Like us and leave a post there if you would like for us to deal with your question on that venue. And also, another address, www.facebook.com slash capital N Newton, capital NC, Church of Christ. And follow us on Twitter if you have that uh, capacity. Uh, at, and uh, again, to, uh, give us a tweet at, at Word and Sword. And post a biblical question or comment there. And uh, again, you will receive a biblical book, chapter, and verse answer. And the reason we stress the book, chapter, and verse answer is because that's all that matters. Uh, if, you can't, if you can't have a book, chapter, and verse answer for the things that you want to do religiously, then you don't need to be doing them. And we believe that fully. We believe that there needs to be authority for all we do in our worship to God and in our service to God. And service and worship are two different things. Uh, the daily work that we do for the Lord, the daily things we do in serving God, the day-to-day -day walk is our service and our walk in Christ. And then our times where we pause and we worship the Lord are also important. And that's when we come together to do together the things that God has given us to do together. And again, we invite you to come and be a, be a part of the Newton Church of Christ and, uh, and visit their services if you have that opportunity. Also, if you um, 
we deal at the first of every program with the most important question in the world. What must I do to be saved? Are you saved? And, are, and then we're going to ask another question. Are you saved like the Lord says you're to be saved? Now, again, let's, let's look at what the chart says. This chart uh, talks about not only what Jesus said, but also what the apostles said to verify it. First of all, we're going to look at John 12, 48, where the Lord says we're supposed to hear Him. Hear the Lord. Hear Jesus. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing the Word of God. So I don't have any faith if I don't hear the Word of God. Now there's a lot of people that read the Bible. Uh, many of you have called in. And, they, and you say, well, I've read the Bible three or four times. I'm on my fifth reading of the Bible or my second reading of the Bible. Or I'm, getting, I'm into the middle of the Bible now. I'm good for you. That is wonderful that you're reading the Bible. But again, there's a difference in, in uh, reading and in understanding. And so until we read with understanding, and again, do you understand what you're reading? The eunuch in Acts 8 was riding along reading, but he didn't understand what he was reading. And he told Philip that he didn't understand that. And so Philip uh, went, got in the chariot and rode with him, and they talked about Jesus. And he preached unto him Jesus, and then the, young, the, the eunuch was converted, and he believed the things that were being said. Except you believe that I am He, you'll die in your sins. Romans 10.10, with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto eternal life. Galatians 3.26 says that we are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And Hebrews 11.6 says without faith you can't please Him. He that comes to God must believe that He is. And I think that's a point that all of us would agree on these first two. We have to hear about Jesus. We have to believe what He has said in His Word and what the Apostles wrote. We must believe the Bible to be the inspired Word of God and our authority in all things that we do religiously. And in also we know in Luke 13, 3 that we need to repent of our sins. Acts 17, 30, Paul says, times of this ignorance God winks at, but now commands all men everywhere to come to repentance. In Acts 2, 38, when the people asked what must we do to be saved, they were told to repent and be baptized, every one of them. They had to change the way they were living. These were people that had murdered Jesus. They had to be sorry for what they'd done. They had to recognize that they had murdered their own Messiah. And that was a major deal. They could be, they were forgiven for that, those that obeyed, 3,000 of them. But they had to repent of it. They had to turn from their wickedness and also turn from all the things that they had done that led up to that. And then in Matthew 10, 32, if we confess Jesus before men, He'll confess us before His Father. In Acts 8, that we just brought up a minute ago, the eunuch said, here's water, what hinders me from being baptized? And Philip said, if you believe, you can. And he made that confession, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And so again, that confession, very, very important that we do that. So. Hearing, believing, repenting, and confessing are things that we would all agree that a person needs to do to please God, and must do to please God. And so, equally, Jesus taught in Mark 16, 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that disbelieves shall be damned. In Acts 2 and verse 38, again, quoting what Peter said to the people on Pentecost, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. So baptism needs to be into Christ for remission of our sins. And when we do that, the Lord, Acts 2, 42-47, the Lord adds to the church daily those who are being saved. The saved are added to the church. Those who are baptized into Christ for remission of sins are the saved. And they are added to the body of Christ. And that's unique, and that's, that's notable, and that's reasonable, because Jesus' blood not only saved us from our sins, but also purchased His church. In Romans 6, verses 4 through 6, we see there that baptism is a likeness of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. We die to sin, we are buried in water, and we are raised to walk a new life, but the water doesn't save us. It is the blood that saves us, but it is received in the waters of baptism. Galatians 3.27, we put Christ on in baptism. And in 1 Peter 3 and verse 21, we see there the like figure, talking about in the days of Moses, where an eight were, souls were saved by water, the like figure 
wherein even baptism doth also watch this, save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. So if we fulfill these commandments, we're done, right? No. No, we must be faithful until we die. All right? You'll be a Christian in the church, the Lord's church. He has added you to that. And you are expected to serve God faithfully until you die. Revelation 2 and verse 10b and Matthew chapter 24 and verse 13. We must continue in serving the Lord faithfully. Not, not fall short of it, but always be urgent about our service to the Lord and putting the kingdom first. Well, tonight we're going to, we're going to review just a little bit, but not much in what we talked about in the last program. The apostles worked miracles. That is absolutely beyond a doubt. I don't think there would be any disagreement at all on the apostles working miracles. These miracles, according to Acts chapter 2 and verse 43, and also Acts 5 and verse 12 and Acts 14 and verse 3, these miracles were done to confirm that the words that were preached were God's word. Now remember in the New Testament times, uh, in the times of the apostles, we see that there was not a Bible, New Testament Bible, that was running around. It was in process. There was no completed word at that time in the New Testament. Now the Septuagint, the Old Testament, was in, was in place. People had a copy of that. But they did not have a copy of the New Testament because it was still being written. All right, it hadn't been published yet. And so uh, they didn't have that copy. So how do we know that somebody is preaching and teaching God's Word? That would been, have been a question that they would have had back then. How do we know an apostle is teaching you the truth? They could lie to you. And of course the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. They could have told people anything they wanted to tell them. But having the power of miracles and confirming that the words that they were speaking was, were of God was an absolute essential aspect of God's plan in bringing about the salvation of mankind. Now turn, if you will, to Acts chapter 5 and verse 12, and we'll look there about some of the things that are talked about in Acts 5 about this confirmation of the Word, confirming the Word. In Acts chapter 5, looking at verse 12, many signs and wonders were being done among the people through the hands of the apostles. By common consent, they would all meet in Solomon's colonnade. All right, so what does it say there? Many signs and wonders were being done by the apostles. Were they putting on a show? Had they gone into the performance industry? Had they won uh, the world's got talent? Had they won that? No, they weren't just performing. They were doing these things to try to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And having the power to work signs and miracles, having the ability to do miracles, and to verify that what they are, were saying was true, that was why the miracles were given. Even when Jesus had them while He was here, the miracles that He did were not converting anybody. They were confirming the words that were spoken. In uh, Acts chapter 14 and verse 3, if you'll look there. Acts 14, 3. So they stayed there for some time and spoke boldly in reliance on the Lord who testified to the message of His grace by granting that signs and wonders be performed through them. Now that's Acts 14 and verse 3. Acts 2 and verse 43, the first uh, sign that they had there was the idea that they were speaking in tongues. And those tongues that they had in Acts 2, 43 were languages of the people, and they're enumerated in the text there. Some 19 different languages were spoken, and everyone understood in their own tongue or their own language. All right? And so understanding that, the first manifestation of, of the power of, of, the, of the apostles to teach the truth was done when the Holy, Holy Spirit fell on them, and they began to speak in tongues. Now some people thought they were drunk, but they told them that they were not, for it was just in the morning, and nobody gets drunk by 9 o'clock. In verse 12 of 2 Corinthians chapter 12, these were the signs of an apostle, and notice what it says. The signs of an apostle were performed among you in all endurance, not only signs, but also wonders, 
and miracles. So how did you know someone was an apostle? Because they said so? No. Remember, they're going to be preaching in places that people don't even know them. And so the signs of an apostle were these miracles and signs and gifts that they had given to them by the baptismal measure of the Holy Spirit. Now, with that in mind, let's look at Mark 16 and verse 17 and 20, through 20. Read with me, if you will. And these signs will follow those who believe. All right, let's look at Mark 16, 17 through 20. All right. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they'll recover. So then, after the Lord has spoken this to who? To them. All right. Who's he sending out? The apostles. He was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere. Watch this. The Lord working with them and confirming what? The word through the accompanying signs. Notice the signs were an accompaniment. The word was that which had to be confirmed by these signs. So the signs were given to confirm the word, not the word, a byproduct of the signs. You see that? All right. So these were things that were going to be done by the apostles, and that's who's being spoken to. Those are the, they're the them. Now in Hebrews chapter two and verse four, notice what is said by the Hebrew writer about how God spoke to mankind. God also bearing witness both with signs, with wonders with various miracles and with the gifts of the Holy Spirit, watch this, according to His own will. All right? So God was orchestrating all of this. It is God's plan that this took place. And that in the beginning of the church, in the first, in the, after the establishment of the church in Pentecost, the brethren needed to know what they needed to do to serve the Lord like they should. And so the teaching that was done was accompanied by the miraculous capacity of, the, of, of people to confirm that what was being said was true. Now in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, if you have your Bibles, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, um, there are nine gifts that are spoken of there. The gift of tongues is the next to the last one, and interpretation of the tongues is the last one. Well. What was the problem at Corinth? Why are these tongues listed? Let's go back and take a little bit of a history lesson with the Corinthian brethren. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 1 Corinthians 1, and look if you will at verse 7. Well, let's just read from verse 4. I thank God for you because of God's grace given to you in Christ Jesus, that by Him you were made rich in everything, in all speaking and all knowledge, as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you do not lack any spiritual gift, as you eagerly wait for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ." All right. So this was a congregation that had an abundance of spiritual gifts, but this is a congregation that had a lot of problems. Now, this, this was a congregation that came out of a very wicked environment in the city of Corinth. You can come back to me now. They had a very wicked environment, and they had been involved in serving the deities of, of men. Involved in the serving of those deities was the exercise of a lot of different uh, incantations. A lot of mythology, a lot of mysticism that went on in idol worship with the Corinthians. And some of the brethren at, Cor at Corinth came from those types of backgrounds. Well, if you read your history book, you know that tongue speaking is not something that is just talked about in the New Testament. But as you look at tongue speaking in the, in the Old Testament and you look at it throughout history, it, is, it, it was involved in the idol worship going all the way back into Egypt. Where the, have you ever seen the movies about the Greek mystics and how they would go to the oracle? And the oracle would go into a trance, usually drug induced, and they would begin to murmur and to say phrases that meant nothing. 
That was the type of tongue speaking, that was the type of demonstration of spiritual gifts of tongues that the people of God in the Corinth had begun to make the spiritual gift, the right gift from God. That's what they were doing. They were abusing it in chapters 12 through chapter 14. And Paul is setting them straight on this. They've had a great deal of selfishness in how they've been doing these things. They, they're letting people think in the church there that if you have gifts of tongues that you're an elite Christian and that you're somehow better than everybody else. That you're an oracle or you're a mystic and you can see and talk about things that no one can talk about and it's a mysterious thing and they were using the gift of tongues that way. Well, notice the tongues that are talked about in the scripture. The spiritual gift of tongues and the Holy Spirit's gift of tongues to the apostles and to the household of Cornelius. That those were actually languages. They were not a uh, different idea, a different uh, guttural talk or gibberish talk that no one could understand. Well, let's look at this again. 1 Corinthians 12, there were nine gifts given. Why were these nine gifts given? Again, how do you know that you have the truth in the first century? Well, notice in the congregation, there, was, there were ways to tell whether somebody was preaching the truth or one, whether one wasn't. You had brethren there who had the word of wisdom. They had the spiritual gift of wisdom, the spiritual gift of knowledge, that they had a gift from God to know that what was being said was true. And they could verify that it was. So at the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word was established. They had something that was miraculous faith. A faith that comes by hearing the Word of God. Well, this was a miraculous way because the faith had to come from hearing, not just in written form, but from hearing God's Word in other ways. They had the gift of healing. Not everyone had all of these gifts, but they had these gifts in part. They had these gifts in segments. Uh, several people, one wouldn't have uh, all of these gifts, but there would be several people in the church at Corinth that would have, have these gifts. And notice that they would have the gift of healing. So this was a spiritual gift. And we, kind of like Calvin on his commentary, when he looks at the spiritual gift of, of healing, he says, well, we all understand what the healing is. Let's move to the next one. <laughs> and I think that's, that's very clear. Then the gift of prophecy, and prophecy was a spiritual gift. It was that way in the Old Testament, it was that way in the New Testament. God chose prophets, and there were people who could prophesy. Now, all prophecy involved preaching, but not all preaching is prophecy. There is a difference. Preaching and teaching the Word of God is separate and apart from prophesying. Prophecy was speaking the things that were to come to pass. and preaching and teaching was involved in the things that came from God that would be verifying the message that he was presenting. And then look at this, the discerning of spirits. Turn to Matthew 7, 21, if you will, for just a moment. There's a very important passage that Jesus was teaching there. In Matthew 7, verse 21, do you remember that's a passage to religious people? And he says there, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Have we not cast out demons? And have we not done many mighty wonderful signs in thy name? And the Lord will say to them, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness, I do not know you. Depart from me. I think he was prophetically talking about what would happen in the New Testament church. The ability to discern spirits was the ability to know whether someone was speaking from God or whether they were speaking something else. Remember there was, and John talks about there were those who at that time were called antichrists. They were coming in the name of Christ, preaching that Christ didn't exist. How would you know that that wasn't true? Well, you had people in the churches, not just at Corinth, but in other places, had Christians who were able to discern the spirits to see if they be of God. And then we have this term tongues, and that's probably why you tuned in tonight and why you're with us, and we thank you for that. 
But this idea of tongues is languages. It's, the term is glossolalia. And that is the idea of the speaking with the tongue, with the mouth. Now, the interpretation of tongues was also a spiritual gift. And one was not supposed to be used without the other. And that's what Paul goes on to correct at Corinth when you look at chapters 13 and 14. He chastises the people for using spiritual gifts of tongue speaking as their own little carnival game. And he says that's not what you're supposed to do with that. And shame on you for doing it. He says there needs to be edification when tongue speaking is done. Now modern tongue speaking, friends, the tongue speaking that is done in denominations is not what was done in the first century. I counted 26 websites where it, it can be taught a person who's in Pentecostalism or charismatic movements that a person can be taught how to speak in tongues. New Testament people weren't taught to speak in tongues. It was a gift they got from the laying on of the apostles' hands, and the apostles got it through the, uh, the Holy Spirit that came on them at Pentecost. Paul got it. He says in, in 1 Corinthians that he has more, more gifts and more tongues. He can speak more tongues than any of them, all of them combined. But what he was speaking was languages. Not guttural, not, not some type of just uh, let your jaw go free. And this is the, one of the instructions that is on the internet. You can look it up. You have to let your jaw go free like this. And then just let yourself go. Very much akin to yodeling or doing the scat uh, runs that a jazz singer would do. Or you might do it in the shower by just making different sounds. You are told to make certain syllables and say certain syllables. And that you say those faster and faster and that you start out saying things almost like a child. Gaga. Baba, mama, mama. See how the jaw dropped? Mama, mama. And when you do that and you keep doing that fast enough, then you keep doing it more and more fast and you do it louder and louder. And you are well on your way to conquering the gift of tongues. I have some phrases here that came out of some of those websites. One of the words that is commonly used among the tongue speakers is shakalakala. 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 And you just say that and you say it faster and you go shakalakala. Shakalakala. And that's one phrase. And you are a verified tongue speaker if you do that and you do it well enough. Another one is putting together some of the syllables. Ziva Racing Lila Lord. And you say that fast enough over and over. Now I'm not, again, let me mention this before I go any further. I'm not making fun of anybody. Because there's some very sincere people that think this is real. They think that their church has taught them to do this. It can't be wrong. But what we're trying to do tonight is to let the Lord and Shepherd of our lives teach us. Let's look at what Jesus says about it. Let's examine this subject that is a divisive subject even among the Charismatics and the Pentecostals. And among the Baptists and among all of the different denominations, there's great controversy with the, with the, the, the community churches even about what constitutes tongue speaking. There's great division over it. And so let's let the Bible be true. And let's all of us be liars. I'm not trying to make fun of people. This is, this is on, I mean, you can verify this. I have here uh, the, on, on the website uh, the, of the Assemblies of God Constitution and Bylaws by Reuben Hartwick, where he says that all Christians will be able to talk in tongues as they grow in their faith. And this second work of grace is done in their lives. Well, if all Christians are promised, all the people in these groups are promised that they should be able to speak in tongues and you are honest and you really can't do these things, 
because you're too honest to sit back and say, that's what I'm going to do, and that's going to be biblical tongue speaking, then you're the odd man out. And if you want to be a, a Christian that's growing, which who doesn't want to be that, then you must do these things in order to have the second work of grace in your life. Now friends, again, very good, very honest, very well-meaning people believe that these types of things are a manifestation of the Spirit possessing them and overtaking them. There is a, they, they would say that this may be a particular prayer language. There are some who will admit that there's no way to understand what any of this means. That it's individual with each person. There are scientists that have studied modern day tongue speaking. And they've come away with the conclusion that there is no way to put the syllables that are used at random together and get any meaning out of it whatsoever. And so the people also tell you that if they believe in an interpreter, that an interpreter tells you what somebody has said or the person themselves tell you what they've said. And then you have confusion even over the interpreter and over the person speaking as to what was said. Some of the people that speak in these things and use these and say it's biblical tongues will tell you, I don't have any idea what I said. Have no idea whatsoever. Now, did you ever watch uh, NCIS? Did you know the actress that was on there that they named D Ziva? Well, Ziva, or Ziva, or Zeva, however you want to pronounce it, and you can pronounce it all three of those ways, is one of the things that is used in the speaking in tongues. Ziva. And then think of this. Roku Nanahashi. Roku Nanahashi. Roku Nanahashi. And then Ichi Nishanshigo. Ichi Nishanshigo. And then someone would say, Eins war drei fünf. Eins war drei fünf. Eins war drei fünf. Shakalaka. Shakalaka. This is a demonstration, friends, of what commonly is used. You just let yourself go. Now in those last two phrases, what you heard was something I made up. It is a real language. It is the number one through ten in Japanese. And the last phrase you heard is the numbers one through five pronounced very quickly together in German. They're real language. That's real language right there. But I put it together with some terms that don't mean anything. And it sounded authentic. If you are watching tonight and you are a person that speaks in tongues as, the, as you believe them to be and as you're taught them to be in the different Pentecostal churches, you may think that I am a person that has the gift of tongues. But I made up and, or, or I just repeated things that I have read today and this past week. Well, tongue speaking today, friends, is not a language in any regular sense, okay? It is not a language at all. It is very closely akin, according to one Pentecostal writer, it is very closely akin to yodeling and to scat singing with jazz. Tongue speaking is also taught. The modern day tongue speaking is taught. And if you don't believe it is, ask your preacher. And if you're in a charismatic group or you're in a Pentecostal group and you, have, you are wanting and desiring to speak in tongues, someone, sometime, somewhere will take you aside and teach you the things that I have just said this, this evening. Or something like this. And you will be told to just give yourself over. Well, friends, the mystics and the, or, uh, the oracles of the heathen world that's what they gave themselves to. Back in the hippie generation, that was my generation sadly, uh, Woodstock, Woodstock was, did you ever see people whirling? And just whirling and whirling and whirling. Over in Turkey there is a, uh, there is a whole group of people called the whirling dervishes. And they give themselves over. They just spin and spin and spin and spin. 
and they get into a, a, a trance state and they begin to utter things while they're in those states. And I guess they have to do something to keep from getting dizzy. But if you look at the flower children and the things like that, they just gave themselves over, just let themselves go. And if you've ever been to Pentecostal churches and Pentecostal services, you'll have those who are spiritual dancers that will get up on stage and they will dance. Usually it's ladies, the men seldom do this, and the children every now and then will do it. But they just let themselves go. And they just give themselves over to, as they say, the spirit. But in essence, what they're doing is giving themselves over to themselves. And again, we're not making fun. We're just telling you what goes on. And I've seen these things with my own eyes. And if you're in these charismatic movements and you think I've misrepresented you in any of this, you call in, let us know. Because I do not want to misrepresent anyone. Maybe the time I saw it, it was a rarity or something unique to that particular church. I don't know. But these are things I've observed. I've seen them happen. Well, again, tongue speaking is taught. Loosen your jaw and loosen your tongue. Speak nonsense syllables. This is in some of the instructions. Do it more and more rapidly. Give yourself over to it. And at the end, always use a phrase that praises God. Hawe Jawa. Hawe Yawa. Praise God. And so, the emotionally minded person will give themselves over to it and all the time they will be feeling like and thinking that they have the Spirit of God. Tongue speaking also that is done today is done in some cases to, that for the pure sake of fun in religion to be with the in crowd and this is one of the three reasons that people say tongue speaking is so popular among the Pentecostal churches and the charismatic groups. This is from their own material. And this is from a writer who, who does not believe that the guttural sounds are tongues. Also, it is part of a quest, he says. It's part of a quest to get close to God. They are told, the people are told, that in order to be close to God, you have to do these things. Well, I want to be close to God, and you do too. So all of us that are spiritually minded are going to try to do what people tell us to do to get close to God, aren't we? And if we put our faith in a preacher or a teacher and not in the Lord and His Word, we will follow after what the person says. There are those who say that these talks and these things like I have just demonstrated tonight, that they are somehow private prayer language. That these are things that a person uses only in their own private prayers. Well, can you pray something that is not from God's Word? Can you pray or teach something that's not from God's Word? No. Also, these things are sought by people who really honestly want to be what God wants them to be. And that is the tragedy of this, brethren and friends tonight. That's the tragedy. Now we're going to pause just a moment because we've got a caller coming in. Yes, yes. Uh huh. Thank you for calling in, sir. You're on the air. Good night. You doing okay tonight? I'm doing fine. How about you? Oh, I'm doing good. Doing good. I was just interested in your conversation about the tongues. Okay. What What was your particular concern? Well, uh, I think you're right on with what you're saying and teaching about the tongues. There, there are people being encouraged to make a noise with their mouth. The way we communicate is with our mouth, and we make noises that people understand. And by just uttering a bunch of noises, you're bound to hit something that sounds like a word to someone else, you know, in a foreign language or the English language or whatever. Right. And that's what, that's what these churches are teaching, mainly Dennis Waggard and them are teaching that if you do that, then you're speaking uh, with an unknown tongue, like Paul said, that you're, that's your verification of your salvation. Right. It's right. actually saying that, that that's a sign that's following them. 
Exactly. And that's the reason they're encouraging people to do it. But what Jesus was trying to explain to the people was when you get off the air, somebody's going to tell somebody else what you said. You're going to be speaking with their tongue. They're going to repeat your message. Right. And that's speaking the new tongue. After you lay your body down, your children are going to say, my daddy told me this and I believe it. He showed it to me in the Bible. Well, that's you speaking with a new tongue, many tongues. Like Billy Graham, he speaks with many tongues, you know. People repeat what he says. They've raised him from the dead, and they're putting out his message, his very words. And that's what Jesus was talking about. We're going to be judged by our words, and they're going to follow after us. Our words are going to follow after us on this earth in some, some degree. And that's what God has showed me about that. And it's, it's just a shame that the people are being misled to think if they utter and, and uh, just jabber with their mouth and make sounds that they're... That they get, but people get a reaction from that because they give in thinking they're obeying the Lord. And they get some kind of rush or some kind of uh, feeling that makes them feel good to give in to what they think is serving God. And then that, that just makes it worse for them. But actually what they're doing is yielding their self to, to what they think is of God and they get some kind of feeling from it. And they just go on trying to trying to repeat the things they're taught. Like you said, it's a thought action. Yeah. And I just enjoyed hearing somebody that knows the truth and will put it out over the air, okay. knowing that you can't reveal it to them. That God has to reveal it to them, but you can you can uh, make it known to them. You know. Well, and that's the thing. Uh, uh, very good comments, and thank you so much for calling. I hope you continue to watch the rest of the program. We have some more things to, to mention tonight, but thank you for your comments. Uh, appreciate them. Thank you. Thank you. Love well, you and the Lord, and you keep up the good work. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. The um, very good comments, and again, the sad thing is, folks, is that there are sincere people. Some of you may be watching, and you may be kind of feeling pretty let down right now. But again, this material, again, not, made, not, not designed to make fun of you, but just designed to just tell the facts as they are. This is it. And again, there are people in Pentecostalism and the charismatic movement that believe that these things are damaging. They're not helpful to the, the different groups that, they're, that are out there. Because again, sincere people are waiting for these things to happen to them. And they're not getting it, so many of them are quitting their religion. They're walking away because they're honest enough to say, this is not something, I can't, I can't settle for this. And my Bible does not, uh, what I read in the Bible in 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, I don't read that that's the tongues that are people are talking about today. Again, tongues were languages. And the uh, caller observed that this new tongue, uh, as he used the phrase, uh, there is a sense in which everything that we say that is from God's Word, God's Word will not return to him void. It will accomplish what he set it out to do. The revealed will of God, the Bible, that we all in this area believe is God's Word. And not just because we believe it, but because it in fact is God's Word. It is sufficient to guide us into all truth. And it will last. It will be the basis upon which we're judged. And when we point someone to the scriptures, it is up to them to obey it. God will not make somebody obey it. God will not reveal it to them in some miraculous way. They must submit their hearts to God. And the heart must be pricked or broken in order for a person to be what God wants them to be. That can happen. But the power is not in tongues. The power is not in healing. The power is not in prophecy. The power is not in faith or knowledge or wisdom. The power is in the Word, Romans 1 and verse 16. It was delivered by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit and the Word are different. The Holy Spirit's not the Word and the Word's not the Holy Spirit. But the Word is the means by which the Holy Spirit dwells in the Christian. Just like Christ dwells in the Christian, and the Christian dwells in Christ. God the Father dwells in the Christian, and the Christian in God the Father. The Spirit dwells in the Christian, and the Christian dwells in the Spirit, and the Word dwells in the Christian, and the Christian dwells in the Word. Again, 
deity dwells in us. We're not denying that. We talked about that on the last program. But the manifestation of that in this day and time is not by some type of miraculous gift. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. The interpretation of tongues in the scripture, the last spiritual gift that's here, the interpretation of tongues was essential in the New Testament church. The context of 1 Corinthians 12 through 14 is in the public assembly, particularly chapter 14. And the inter interpretation of tongues, if a tongue was challenged, if it was challenged what a person had said, what the language had been said, then the person that was the interpreter of the tongue could verify what was being said to be authentic. Now the closest thing we have to this to happening today is when somebody goes around and preaches overseas and they can't speak the language and they have an interpreter that is there. We attended an Italian service in Rome one time and the brethren were very kind there to, to not only give the Italian message to those that were in attendance, for the first half of the service it was Italian. I had no idea what they were saying but I had some enough knowledge of Latin to know some of what they were, they were saying. But I was very relieved when the second part of the service was in English. And they had made PowerPoints in both, in both languages. And they had compared all of it. And that was so important. But I felt very helpless when I was just listening to a tongue. I had no idea what they were saying. I, did, I didn't know if they were preaching the truth or not. But it was a language. They were speaking Italian. And it was a verified language. It was not just, got, just some type of gibberish. And that's what was done in the New Testament times. Again, if you turn to Acts 2, and we'll do this a little later in Acts 2, that's what they have there. In Acts chapter 2 in Jerusalem, there were people from everywhere, Jews from everywhere. So these were the gifts that were given. They were tongues that were understandable. They were nowhere near a second or 25th cousin to what people are doing and saying it's tongues today. The scripture is the standard, friends. And when somebody says, God told me this, or God told me that, or I have this new revelation God is laying on me right now, and this is how tongue speaking starts, a preacher or somebody will say, blah, 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 blah. And the next thing you know, he's telling you some message. Um, God told me that somebody's going to give me money. Well. If God told you that, who's going to argue with that from a guy that says God told him? And if you believe in, in uh, tongue speaking, and he gives you that sign of tongue speaking, which is gibberish, to verify that you need to send him $100 so he can buy him a new plane, or so he can, put it, he can buy a new Mercedes. That's just, that's just conning people, folks. That's all that is. That's a big con game. And it turns a lot of people off to religion totally. It takes honest people who are really searching for the truth. And it turns them against it because of the fraudulent spirit in which it's given. And the things they're told in the name of religion. We learn our answers from God in His Word. Does God talk to me? Yes. But He doesn't whisper in my ears and He doesn't uh, jerk me around and, and make me, uh, my, my mouth start moving real fast or makes me want to lather myself up running around a building. God doesn't make me do that. I'm in control of myself and you are too. But God does reveal himself to us in his word. This Bible is the inspired word of God. It is God talking to us. It is the comforter's words to us. Jesus said, I'll not leave you comfortless. I'll send you the Holy Spirit talking to the apostles and the writers of the New Testament who will guide you, watch this, into all truth. Now friends, if the Spirit was going to guide them into all truth, they had all truth, didn't they? <coughs> Pardon me, so sorry. Now, why do people come together? This is a side point. Remember Paul is correcting problems at Corinth. As you see some of the problems corrected in chapters 12 through 14, 
One of the problems is people were coming together for a show. They were coming together to perform. They were coming together because it was popular to do so. They had a gift. They wanted to show it. And they were you. They became. It basically became a competition, and a show-off period to many people. Well, friends, let's let's fast forward that today. Why do you go to church services? We hear a lot of people say, "I'm." I, I went to church because I get a lot out of it. Is that why you go? Do you go to church services because you get a lot out of it? And if you don't get a lot out of it, you don't go? Is that why? Is that kind of your pattern? If somebody isn't serving you, and if you're not being felt, if you don't feel good when you leave, then all of a sudden, you don't go. That's selfish worship. And that's what was happening in 1 Corinthians 12 through 14. The people were worshiping self selfishly. What's in it for me? What kind of accolades can I get? Boy, people will really be wowed by my tongues today. Don't know what you said, but hey, this is awesome. Or I do know what you said, and you're awesome. People want to be validated, don't they? And the people at Corinth, the ones who had the spiritual gifts, which was a blessing from God, but their improper use of it, just like they had abused the Lord's Supper, they had abused the treatment of one another that were caught up in sin, they had abused uh, the way of uh, settling issues by taking one another to court. They were all about self. And on the, on the spiritual gifts, the same way. Do you come to church services in order to be appeased? Or in order to join together with your brethren and give to one another and ultimately to God the worship that He deserves? That's what makes you sing with all the fervor, the fervor that you can. That's what makes you, when you're in the assembly, enjoy the serving of the Lord's Supper, even though it was a tragic event. You're so thankful together for what was done. When you give of your means together on the first day of the week, there's a unity that's there. And you don't do that because of what you get out of it. That's why Paul put chapter 13, the Holy Spirit put chapter 13 between chapter 12 and 14. Paul said, you, you can speak every tongue that exists. Speak all the languages of the world. You don't have love. You're just noise. Because it's all about you. There are a number of people, even in the Lord's body, friends, that are looking for a church that will serve them. They're not looking for the truth. They're looking for appeasement. There are those who will not come to all the services of the Lord's church even. Because why? Because they think, since there's a self, they're worshiping self, selfishly anyway, that if they don't show up, it only hurts them. But do you know the Lord tells us in 1 Corinthians, part of what He says in chapter 12, is that we all work together in the body of Christ. We're one body. We're not segmented. We're not divided when we come together. That is a, an open show of our unity in Christ when we are together. And it's not about how I feel and whether I feel zippy or whether I feel uplifted or whether I don't. It's all about me sharing in the truth that is preached and taught. In me sharing with, the th with my brethren in the things God has commanded us to do together. That's what it's all about. So the person that realizes that and knows the whole, all of what the Bible teaches about what worship really is, they will know that when they don't come and avail themselves of the privilege of serving God on Sunday morning, Sunday night, well, however many services there are, they will be there because they know the value that it is to other people. It's all about others, folks. It's not all about you. It's about your brethren. It's about us working together in the assembly. And it's not about whether somebody's lesson really pleased me or didn't please me. If it's from God, it must please me. 
If it's what the Bible authorizes, it must be pleasing. And any group of people that makes an attempt to try to appease individual people at the expense of the whole work are barking up the wrong tree, folks. And that's what Paul is telling the Corinthians in chapters 12 through 14. He says, it, it's just, it's awful. He said, I just assume you'd be quiet in the assembly if all you're going to do is do these types of things. And he tells them, he says, you do these things decently and in order. There's an obligation we have to one another when we come together. That's a side point. But I felt like we needed to say that in this context. But back to tongues and these spiritual gifts. Philip worked miracles in Acts chapter 8 and verse 6. And notice, we're going to stress now how a person was able to get miracles. Was able to get spiritual gifts, I'm sorry. Did it just come on them? Did they get it the same way the apostles did? Or did it come through the laying on of hands? Turn to Acts 8 and verse 6. Philip is an evangelist. He was from the church in Jerusalem. And he is an evangelist that goes out, he preaches the gospel, he goes out and teaches and preaches and spent his life doing so, it appears. And he worked miracles. He had, as an evangelist, he had the ability to work miracles to confirm what he's saying was true. But in Acts 8 and verse 6, notice what happens in that context. The apostles had to travel from Jerusalem to Samaria to give the Samaritan Christians that Philip was preaching to the ability to work miracles. They didn't have it. And Philip couldn't give it to them. He was not an apostle. He came out of the church at Jerusalem. He had to be one of the, possibly one of the 3,000. I don't know. But he is one of those six that's called out. But notice here, the apostles had to be called to come from Jerusalem to Samaria to give the Samaritan Christians the ability to work miracles. In Acts 8, verses 14 through 18, read with me if you will. When the apostles who were at Jerusalem, go ahead, heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John, apostles, to them, who when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of Jesus. They were Christians, but they did not have any of these gifts. Then they laid hands on them, and they received the Spirit. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money. And he's chastised for that. Now in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and, ch and verse 15, Paul talks to the Thessalonians, and he says here about the authenticity of the Scripture. He said, the words that are spoken were either directly from God or by epistle, and he makes no difference in the two. Either directly from the Lord were they taught, or they were taught by his epistle. Both of them, the epistle, which was the written record, or the word directly from them. It says here in chapter 2 and verse 15, Therefore, brothers, stand firm and hold the traditions ye were taught, either by our message or by our letter, either by the word that we speak or by the epistle that we write. Okay? So even in the first century, there was a limitation on the idea of, of only receive something that you have verified. Here he says, and this is some time later, that he tells these Thessalonian brethren, either we preached it to you in word, or we wrote it to you in epistle. Both of them are binding. Stand fast in those things. All right. Now here we have an instance where the gospel was being preached and verified by the messages, but also the epistles that were written by those men were equally valid to the people. Okay, while the gospel was in process, while the message was in process. Now, Let's look at the ways in which God has spoken to man. God speaks orally in men. The preaching by the apostles in Acts 2 and verse 3, they were uh, waiting until they were endued with power from on high, and the Holy Spirit fell upon them and they preached. 
Paul in Acts chapter 20 verses 20 through 27 said he was not behind any of the chiefest of the apostles. He had the ability to. It was oral. Spirit filled men in 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 10 were able to preach and teach and did so. God delivered the message to them. and They wrote it down or they preached it and sometimes both. Now in all cases when the message was given through men it was confirmed by miracles, by spiritual gifts of some kind. Now the oral and written um, letters that were given to Paul, that were given to Peter, that were given to John and Jude and the Gospels and to Luke and also to John in Revelation. Notice here that all of these are verifiable too. These are the things when Paul writes, he says, I write the same, same things to all churches. Peter's letters, John's letters, they were guided by the Spirit to write those things. And we are told in such passages of Galatians 1, verses 8 through 10, not to, and that, that anybody that preaches any other gospel, let him be accursed. All right? Now again, these letters were written much later than the initial giving of the, of the gifts to mankind or to, to the churches. Now the things that are written in the Bible for us today, <clears throat> do we have, are we less uh, people, are we somehow less Christians because we don't have miracles today, because we don't have the gift of tongues today, or we don't have the gift of wisdom or the gift of knowledge? We have to read the scriptures and understand it, which we are told in the scriptures we are able to do. No, Jude 3 says we have the word that was once for all delivered to the saints. Peter says we have all things that pertain unto life and godliness. The word of God can be read, which produces faith. When you read, you can understand what the gospel says. Again, when we read it, we can understand it. Now, who has the advantage? <clears throat> Well, the fact is, none of us do. The Word of God was just as valid in the first century as it is right now. But it was given in different ways, wasn't it? Hebrew writer says, God who in sundry times and in divers manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto you by his Son, Jesus. Now remember, Jesus told his apostles, I'll not leave you comfortless. They were worried. What are we going to do now? You're leaving. He says, I won't leave you without, without comfort. I will send you the Holy Spirit. And he will guide you and remind you of all the things that, we have, that I have taught you. It'd be hard to remember all Jesus taught, wouldn't it? We have four Gospels that talk about some of the things, some of them overlapping on some of the things he did on this earth. John tells us many other things truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples that are not written here. That tells us there's a whole lot of things done before the apostles that they were privy to. And the Spirit called to their remembrance these things. They had that measure of the Spirit. And that is not given to everyone. Now do we have what we need to have today? Yes, we do. I want you to turn, if you will, to show the power of the written word to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. All scripture is inspired of God. That means God breathed it. The breath of God breathed into men the infallible words of God. And so, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is profitable or useful for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, so that the man of God might be, watch this, might be thoroughly furnished unto every good work. Thoroughly furnished unto every good work. What does that mean? It means the Word guides the Christian today. Now, a question to those of you who believe that you, there needs to be Latter-day Revelation. And I've talked to people, tried to teach some people, and had some classes with some people in this area who sat across the table and told me that God talks to them. 
just like I was talking to him across the table. He believed that with everything he had. He said, doesn't God talk to you? I said, not like that. He said, how long have you been a Christian? I said, 50 years. He said, oh my, I feel so sorry for you that God doesn't give you messages. Well, I told him, I said, God's given me a bountiful message, but it's not the way, he didn't deliver it in the way you say. And then I asked him a question that he couldn't answer. I said, what would God tell us if he's told us in his word and it's true? And the man said, I believe the Bible is the complete word of God. It's our guide in all things, he said. I said, so what would the Spirit or what would God say to us? What would an angel from God say to us that is not already said to us in the Scriptures? If this gives us all things, as Peter says, that pertain to life and godliness, and all Scripture furnishes us completely unto every good work, then what do I need? And if Jude 3 says, contend earnestly for the faith once for all delivered to the saints, and Revelation 22 says, don't add to it or take from it, then what do I need? And would it not be a violation of God's own words for Him to speak to people individually today? And you answer that. The man hung his head. He could not answer. Not because I'm smart, but because that's what the Word of God teaches, friends. And he said, I'll have to think about that. He's still thinking, I suppose. But that's sad. Because he believed, because his church taught him that God talks to people today. And he believed that he could speak in tongues. He said he wouldn't do it for me, and I brought it to his attention that tongue speaking in the Bible was for the unbeliever. I didn't believe him, not for the believer, and he still wouldn't do it. Well, friends, I've asked other people that speak in tongues to speak in tongues for me in a language they've not studied. Conjugate the verbs of French for me. Conjugate the verbs for, that's simple enough, conjugate the verbs in Latin. Or conjugate the verbs in, let's just do, do an easy one, Japanese, you know, or Chinese, which is Mandarin, by the way. But just go ahead and do that. Be simple enough, just conjugate the verbs. And that's just one part of the speech. And none of them have done it. They can't, because these things have ceased, 1 Corinthians 13 verses 12 and following. They've ceased. Well, these signs shall follow those that believe. Prophecy shall fail, tongues shall cease, and knowledge will vanish away. Now, those are all things that were mentioned. They were all mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12. All right? Now, they would have signs in Mark 16 that would follow them, but notice there would be a time, there's a duration, because 1 Corinthians 13 comes up and says, wait a minute, prophecy is going to cease, tongues are going to cease, but faith, hope, and love will continue. But some things are going to stop. So there is a duration of these things. And 1 Corinthians 13 says that when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away. All right? Supernatural gifts would be removed from among men. 1 Corinthians 13. But yet signs would follow some people in the first century, the apostles. And they would pass the gift on to others. And notice the means by which these gifts were given. It was given by the laying on of the apostles' hands, Acts 8. So when the last apostle died, friends, the means by which these things would be passed on also passed. Because that was God's wisdom, God's arrangement. Now has God had other periods of time where he dealt with men one way but now doesn't? Has God ever spoken to men directly before this? <coughs> Pardon me. And the answer to that is yes. In the patriarchal period, God spoke to the oldest male leader of a family. He spoke to them. 
He spoke to Noah. He spoke to Adam. He spoke to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to Joseph, and so on. God spoke directly. He spoke to Job. But he doesn't do that today. Except through the word. God spoke the law through Moses. And it was the law of the Jew. To all Jews. But he did not include the Gentile in that law itself. Except to make arrangements for them as they lived among the Jews. So the patriarchal age continued to the cross. But the law of Moses was spoken to Moses. But God doesn't speak to us through Moses today, does he? No. He has in these last days spoken unto us through his son, Jesus. So we see that there have been things that were in particular time periods, that those time periods have vanished. And if we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12 through 14, we see that there is also a period of time here where things will be used. Jesus performed miracles. His apostles were able to perform miracles. And they were also able, even afterwards, as the Spirit came on them, they were able to perform miracles. New Testament Christians were able to perform miracles and had the gift of tongues, and so did the apostles. But it was through the manifestation with the apostles of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And that was only given to two groups of people. That's the apostles and the household of Cornelius. But to no one else. The way anyone else got the abilities that were given, and they didn't get all of them, was through the laying on of the apostles' hands. And that was obviously limited to the duration of the apostles at best. Okay. John died sometime after 90, 96 AD. The last apostle that was alive. Well, that tells us something. And that is that these things went away. Because the complete was there. The word is complete today, friends. We carry a Bible around. We, it's estimated that in the United States there are enough Bibles for most people to have one in every bedroom of their house. I counted mine the other day. I don't know why I did it. But I've got 19 Bibles at my house. Somebody says, boy, you got a lot of Bibles. Well, I preached a number of years. And you wear them out when you're using them. I can't throw one away. I'm looking at how, what, it, what, it, what type of investment I have to make to, to have them rebound, re, rebound now so I can use them. But again, the Bible is the Word of God to mankind. It's valuable. You don't think it's valuable? You go to a country where people don't have Bibles, where not everybody has one. It's a cherished possession. They would, they would find me extravagant to have 19 of them. Why would a man have that many Bibles? And we need to share the Bible with all the people we can. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 13, notice what is said in 1 Corinthians 13. And let's just go over there and read that for just a minute, because this is where the text is of 1 Corinthians 13. Paul is talking to them in the midst of the abuse of spiritual gifts. He's talking to them about something that they need to have. And he does a little pause in here. He talks about the unity in the body of Christ in the last part of chapter 12. He says in, in beginning with verse 12, As the body is one and has many parts, and all the parts of that body through many are one body, so also is Christ. We're all baptized by one spirit into one body. That's one church. Whether Jews or Greeks. So the body is not one, but many. If the foot says, because I'm not of the hand, I don't belong to the body, in spite of this, it still belongs to the body. And if the ear says, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, in spite of this, it still belongs to the body. And the point goes on and on with other parts of the body. He says, notice what he says, you are the body of Christ. At Corinth, talking to the Corinthians, and individually, you're members of it. Now, why would he bring out that? Because they were divided. 
because they were involved in party spirits, because they were involved in it's all about me. And so he brings them home and says, wait a minute, it's not all about you. He says, God has placed these in the church, apostles, prophets, teachers, miracles, gifts of healing, helping manage various kinds of languages, all apostles, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, and do every, does everyone do miracles? Do all have the gift of healing? Do all speak in languages? And do all interpret? Desire the greater gifts, and I will show you an even better way. So in spite of all these gifts, these tongues, there's something that's better. Something that is better. He doesn't say that these gifts aren't necessary because they were. But he's saying, you got this thing all wrong if you think the gifts are an end in and of themselves. The Lord didn't put you on this earth and set you in the church to be a performer. There's a reason for these things. And you're abusing it. And you're, you're making people that don't have these gifts feel like they're somehow lesser people. But notice what he says here. He goes on in chapter 13 and starts it out. If I speak in the languages of men and of angels but do not have love, I'm just noise. I'm a clanging cymbal. Now, one of the things that happened in the heathen world, in the heathen temples, was the clanging of cymbals that went off when their God spoke to them. And so they clanged the cymbals. And Paul uses that analogy here. If I speak with the tongues of, the Lord, of men and of angels, if I do that, he doesn't say that, they, that he could do that. He doesn't say anybody else can. He said, even if, and that's the force of even, or if there. Even if I could speak with all the tongues of men and all the tongues that, let's say, an angel has, then I'm just noise if I don't have love. You see how he talks about a better way? Faith, hope, and love will continue. Look, we'll see that. Then he defines love. And we talk about this at weddings, and everybody talks, puts it up in their house. Husbands read it to their wives, and that's, that's good. No problem. But it's written for brethren to read to brethren and talk to one another about how they ought to treat one another. And how the Lord loves us, so we ought to reciprocate by loving one another this way. You see how that settles this party spirit? This spirit that says it's us against you. It's my way or the highway. I've got to have it my way, and I don't care who it hurts, even the whole body. He says, oh, no. No, no. There's some important things here. He says, love never ends, verse 8. But as for prophecies, they'll come to an end. How much clearer could it be in verse 8 of 1 Corinthians 13? And as for languages or tongues, they will cease. Now we know that people still talk and talk in languages. But the, the spiritual gift of manifestation of languages, and people hadn't even studied that they could speak, he says that's going to stop. And as for knowledge, it will come to an end. Now we all know that there's still knowledge out there. But the way it was given, the spiritual gift of knowledge, would vanish away. It's going to end. For now, and watch this, for now we know in part. Now, that's the first century. Now we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will come to an end. That perfect that is there, friends, is not Jesus coming back, or it's not Jesus coming back to this earth. There is something that is happening then that will not happen when the perfect has come. And the perfect there is not Christ, but Christ is called the Word. So the completed word, the whole word, not in fragments, not in needing nine different spiritual gifts to discern what the truth was, but he says, when that which is perfect is come, that which is partial or fractions shall be done away with. Now look at the chart, if you will. It's a very simple illustration. But notice here, if the blue section of the pie is apple pie, then what's the green section? And if we were to divide the green section 
into four or five blue sections, what would the rest of the green part be? And what would the whole pie be? All right. It would be apple pie, all of it, wouldn't it? All of it. So do we have a whole apple pie here? We do, don't we? But we got it in parts. We've got it in fractions. We would use that term, fractions. Now what is four-fourths? It's one, isn't it? Four-fourths is one. The whole pie is an apple pie, but it is given in segments. The blue section of the pie, for analogy's sake, is prophecy, the word of knowledge, the tongue speaking, God's word, in part revelation. In other words, revelation given and doled out to this man, to this man, to this man, and verified by prophecy, by word of knowledge, by tongue speaking, by interpretation, and so on. Word of wisdom. These were the nine gifts that helped one to determine whether this was from God or whether it wasn't. Now once an arrangement is done, okay, when we build a house and we have scaffolding on the outside, once the structure is completed, the scaffolding comes down because it's really an eyesore at that point. You have a completed product, but while it's in process, you need that scaffolding, don't you? Particularly if you're putting up brick and things. Well, okay. Now, the prophecy, the word of knowledge, tongue speaking, all essential for the time that they were there. But now we don't need it. We have a confirmed word. We have a word that was once for all delivered to the saints, Jude 3. All right? Now here's what he said in 1 Corinthians 13. Supernatural gifts are going to be removed from among men. That includes tongues, and he says so. Not the only one, but all spirit supernatural gifts will be removed from among men. Do you believe the Bible, preacher? Yes. Do you believe in miracles? I absolutely do. Well, then why can't miracles go on anymore? You had never seen anything happen that made you wonder? Yeah, I have. I sure have. But my Bible tells me not what I want to feel or not what I want to explain away and say that's a miracle. My Bible tells me miracles ceased because it was a spiritual gift. And those things are done away. I don't need a miracle to confirm the Word of God. I can read it and see that it confirms itself, doesn't it? It's all in agreement. And we all believe that. And it's notable to me that there are people who believe the Bible is the inspired Word of God, but then they talk and they act like they need some other revelation in order to be what God wants them to be. I'll tell you what, our, my faith stands in God. And my faith stands in His Word, too. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation, watch this, to all those that believe. Okay. Do you have to believe it? Nope. Is God going to come to you and tell you something else? Nope. Nope. Just like He's not going to send another sacrifice for sin. He's done what He's going to do. We can either accept it or reject it, and that's what we will do. Now, let's look at this chart, and maybe this will make it a little more clear for us. There are things that exist that are existing now during the in part time, okay? Prophecy, tongue speaking, word of knowledge, and so on. And then the future of each one of these things, prophecy, tongue speaking, and the word of knowledge, it would vanish away, friends. But notice what would last. Items one through three do not exist today, like they did in Bible times. But I tell you what has existed all the way through all of this, faith, hope, and love. They abide, and he says so. Faith, hope, and love abide. But very clearly, out of the six things he mentions, Prophecy, tongue speaking, and the word of knowledge will go away. They'll fail, they'll cease, they'll vanish away. They don't exist today, friends. But faith, hope, and love does. How much more specific and clear could he have been? 
And why does he say this to these, these people? All you got to do is read 1 Corinthians to see that these people were about the most wadded up group of Christians you ever saw. My goodness, were they in a mess. And they had so much potential. They were, they were in a town that was just eaten up with sin. And they were the light in that community. And Paul chastises them hard in chapter 1, or in the first letter. And they correct a lot of the things that are going on there. But what the main thing that they correct is they get rid of their selfishness. It's not the church of you. It's the church of the Lord. And they needed to learn that lesson just like many need to learn it today. The all-sufficient word. Turn to John 20, verses 30 through 31. All right. The all-sufficient word of God. Is the word of God sufficient for us today? That's the question, isn't it? Or do we need some added revelation? And whose revelation are we going to have? Since we don't have spiritual gifts to verify it, then whose revelation are we going to, going to have? Are we going to believe 12 apostles that are self-appointed apostles in the Mormon church and believe them? Are they the authority? How about the Pope? Is he the authority? Is he the verifier of all truth? Well, he says he is. And the apostles for the Mormon church say they are. And numerous preachers in pulpits say they're the arbiter of truth because they tell people, God told me to tell you this. And millions of dollars have been bilked out of people from preachers that said, God told me that you need to send me money. We got people on this station previous to us that are selling all kinds of things. They're selling meals. You need to send a dollar fifty so that you can feed the hungry. Where are these hungry people? They're just hungry people. Well, are they in Hickory? Where are they? Let me go give them a dollar and a half or go take them to a restaurant and spend more than that on it. Let me feed them. Let me take them to an all-you-can-eat restaurant. No, you need to send us a dollar fifty. That's sad, isn't it? Tell me who they are. Where are they? Where are they located? So that I can send money directly to them. Now, if I send it to an organization, you know what's going to happen? My dollar fifty will come seventy-five cents real quick because of the carrying charges. But if I know a hungry person standing right there in front of me, if you'll tell me where they are, I can go take them to a restaurant, and I can really feed them. Not just one meal, but a bounty. And it's notable to me too. When people start talking about giving, we give people minimums, don't we? Why would I give somebody that needs something the minimum? Why wouldn't I give them all I can? Why would I just stick with one meal? Well, you see, when they say that God has spoken to them and they talk in tongues, quote, on the air, as a demonstration that God's telling them this, and honest people like many of you are watching that and say, well, I need to send them a dollar and a half. Why don't we just send them ten dollars? Why don't we send them thirty? Friends, there's nothing wrong with feeding the hungry, and we have a lot of hungry people to feed, and Jesus says that was a part of what we do as Christians. But I tell you what, the money raising schemes people have out there are limitless. And I'd like to see the people. Tell me the name, tell me the address, tell me where this money is going, what organization is getting it, and how much of it is actually getting to the hungry person. Show it to me. Then I'll make my decision. But you know, rather than do that, honest, good people, just write a check. Because brother so-and-so told me to do it. And that God said it to him. Friends, God doesn't do that today. He doesn't speak to people in any other way than his word. Now John 20 and verses 30 and 31. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. You believe that? I do. The things that are written are written and are sufficient for us to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We've already read 2 Thessalonians 3, or 2 Timothy 3, but in 2 Peter chapter 1, 3 through 4, what does that say? The word is sufficient, isn't it? He has given unto us all things that pertain 
unto life and godliness. Now also the Bible tells us don't depart from the word. It doesn't say don't depart from speaking in tongues. It doesn't say don't depart from working miracles. It doesn't say that because those things are coming to an end. It says don't depart from the word. Now I wonder why that is. Why would Paul tell the Galatians in Galatians 1, 7 through 9, Though we are an angel from heaven, preach unto you any other doctrine than that which you have received, let him be anathema. Let him be damned. That's what the anathema means. That's totally, totally damned. And that's, a, that's quite a penalty. We don't have the authority as preachers and teachers of God's Word today to, to say things that are not found in God's Word. And that was able to be said in Galatians 1, 7 through 9. So evidently, before the close of the first century, these things were beginning to cease. Romans 16, 17, and 18. In the Word of God is revealed the knowledge of God from faith unto faith. The righteous shall live by faith in what? Faith in God's Word. Faith comes by what? By hearing the Word of God. Okay? Always has. And it was done by a direct operation of God speaking to men in the patriarchal time, in Him speaking through Moses, and in Him speaking through people in the first century. But it does it. But that's all changed, hasn't it? It changed twice. God spoke directly to men. God spoke through prophets. God spoke through Moses. God spoke through men and gave them spiritual gifts and through the gift of the Holy Spirit gave the apostles the, the ability to speak in tongues. But now he doesn't do that. What's so hard for that? God's changed it. Now we have the perfect, the complete thing. We got the whole story. It's not a mystery. We got the whole story. The mystery revealed. My wife has been putting a puzzle together. She got that thing put together. She saved me five pieces to put in there. She, I guess she figured I could put five pieces in there. Okay? But you know what? As long as those five pieces were out, the puzzle wasn't complete. It just bothered me. So I finally went and got sat down and did that. Put those five pieces in there. Boy, that's a pretty puzzle. Well, it wasn't complete until what? Until it was complete. And the whole picture is here now. Friends, we've got the whole thing put together right here. Romans 15 and verse 4, we can look back on the things of the Old Testament and let's see those shadows in the Old Testament and say, wow, that means something. That wasn't some random event. God's plan is beautiful when it's all put together. The puzzle's here. Wow, what a pretty puzzle. What a wonderful message. It's all complete and it's the same thing. The theme of the Bible is the same all the way through. God's love for man and his willingness to redeem man back to himself. Man sinned, but God wants to bring him back. Not access to that tree of life again. Genesis starts with the loss of it, and Revelation ends with the reclaiming of it. Access to the tree of life. The main character of the whole Bible is Jesus Christ. We, we know that now. We can read the whole thing. But the people in the time that Abraham lived, they were looking forward. They died. The prophets died. Not seeing the fulfillment of the things they prophesied. We can read it all, you see. What a blessing. Do you rather live during the time of spiritual gifts, friends, or you rather live now? Where we don't have to worry about what's something that you can check me out. You don't have to have a spiritual gift. You don't have to have a baptismal measure of the Holy Spirit. You have to have a Bible. And you can tell whether I'm preaching the truth or whether I'm not. You can check me out. And the Bereans did just that. They searched the scriptures daily to see if what was being said was true. And that was of Paul. They checked Paul out. He's an apostle. He wrote most of the epistles. He wrote 15 books of the scripture, almost, some say 17. But he wrote all these, and they're checking him out. Now, friends, that tells us if people are checking out an apostle to make sure he's preaching the truth, I think they ought to check me out. I think you should. And I think you ought to check your preacher out, too, whoever they are. Now, they'll probably be highly offended that you would think they would need to be checked out, but you need to check out your preachers. And you don't need to just swallow the Kool-Aid, to use a Jim Jones analogy. You need to, to search out things and see if they're from God, to try the spirits to see if they are of God.
because false spirits existed in the first century and they checked them out. But there were lying spirits. There were people that said they were Jesus Christ. There were people who said that Christ wasn't even Christ. There were Gnostic philosophies or all kinds of philosophies. How'd they know what the truth was? They checked it out. They checked it out through the words that were given, even if they were checked out during the time of the partial gifts that were given. They could determine what the truth was. Man always has been able to determine what the truth of God is. And we have a different way to determine it today, but boy, we can determine it. Well, we need to confine ourselves to what's revealed in the Bible. I testify to you, everyone that hears the words of the prophecy of this book, John says, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in it. And if anyone takes away from the words of the prophecy of this book, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things that are written in this book. That's the completed, that's the perfect, that's what comes. And when it comes, when the completed word is fulfilled, it's all here, then that which is in part is done away. Well, friends, the Holy Spirit and tongues, it's what we've talked about tonight. What about the Holy Spirit? You believe in the Holy Spirit? I do. Believe He indwells the Christian? I sure do. But I don't believe He does it in some miraculous way. Preacher, have you been baptized with the Holy Spirit? Nope. Do you have the gift of the Holy Spirit? Yep. Really? But you've not had a baptismal measure of the Holy Spirit? Nope. Sure hadn't. Nor have you. How do you know that, preacher? I checked it out in God's Word. I checked it out with the, with the authority. And the Bible says only two people, two groups of people, got the baptismal measure of the Holy Spirit. It was never commanded, it was always promised to two groups. That's the Jews and the Gentiles. The Jews are the apostles, and also the Gentiles would have been the household of Cornelius. And that's it. Those are the only two instances. And Acts 8 would prove that because Philip was baptized and he was preaching the gospel. But he didn't have the ability to pass on the gifts. He didn't have that baptismal measure, did he? Nope. So when those all died, what happened to that baptismal measure of the Spirit? Nobody's gotten it since, and nor will they ever. But yet we've got Pentecostal and Charismatic people today that are telling us that in these last days these things have, have revived, and that they're coming back, and this is a sign of the end of time. It isn't any such thing, because my Bible says it's not. How do you know that? I've read it. And I've proven all things, I've proven them, those doctrines and those ideas, to be in disagreement with what God says, therefore they're a lie. And I let God be true, and every man a liar, including myself. I don't hold on to things that are not true. And I will not accept those things that can't be proven from the Word of God. That's why we say we'll answer your question with a book, chapter, and verse answer. We don't say, we'll answer your question by me mumbling some words up here and acting like I have the Holy Spirit. And you'll just take whatever I say, no matter what I say. No. I'm not going to give you my opinions on this. What does it say? And friends, I want to tell you something. You're not going to find a lot of folks out there that are reading this and studying it and learning what it says. You find a lot of readers. But you don't find people that read it with the idea of discerning and checking out their life to see if what's being done is true. If your practices are true and changing, letting it change your life. That's what the Bible does. Well, the question comes up, and this was a question that was asked and while we're dealing with this. Would you please explain the speaking in tongues as this practice took place in the early church? What was the nature of those tongues? Well, literally speaking, let's, let's get simple. What we've talked about, literally speaking, the tongue is an organ. I've got a tongue, it's right here. You have a tongue, most of us have tongues. And speech within the mouth is formed by the use of our tongue. And if we miss in parts of our tongue, we can't pronounce words. Now, now 
By metaphorical use, the term is used commonly in literature for a human language. Revelation 5 and verse 9, Revelation 7 and verse 9 would be demonstrations of that. Herodias, for example, used the expression language of Pulaski and the tongue spoken by Pulaski interchangeably. So he used the term tongue spoken and the term tongue to describe a, a spoken language. All right. So we have to interpret the term tongue in the light of how it's used. Okay, we're not talking about everybody has a tongue. I've got a tongue, all God's children's got tongues. We're talking about a language that is spoken. Shortly before Jesus went back to heaven, he promised his disciples that one, one of the gifts that would accompany believers would be the confirming the validity of their message. And one of the ways that that would be done is by the ability to speak with new tongues. That's the phrase that the, that the man talked about that called in. New tongues. They were new to the person that was speaking them. They had not been studied. Now you look at Acts 2. We don't have time to go into all that with our limited time at the end here. But in Acts chapter 2, what happened on Acts 2? The Holy Spirit came on the apostles. And in the lessons that were preached, Peter's is recorded, but every man understood in his own, watch this, language. And I said we didn't have time, but we're going to take time, okay? Turn over there to Acts chapter 2. They all understood in their own language. You see the idea of edification with the use of New Testament tongues? It was for edification. It was to bring about an understanding not to cause confusion and make people say, wow, he knows something nobody else does. No, that's not the reason for the demonstration of these things. All right, so we, we, hear in, we see in Acts 2 that uh, everyone is there. There were 3,000 that are added to the church. Um, and again, these signs, these, the Spirit was being poured forth at that day and entering into a new age. That's the age of the New Testament. But notice here, Peter's sermon starts, but look if you will before that in verses 5 through verse uh, 13. There were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. When this sound occurred, the multitude came together and was confused because each one of them heard them speaking in his own language. And they were astounded and amazed. Look, aren't, those, aren't these who are speaking Galileans? And the significance of that is Galileans were not the smartest people in the uh, sharpest knife in the drawer. They weren't educated, but they were smart. They were, they were, they were good people. But he says here, how is it then that we each hear in our own language, or native tongue. Wow. We each hear in our native tongue. And then look at the demonstration. Parthian, Medes, Elamites, Mesopotamians, Judeans, Cappadocians, Pontus, Asians, Phrygians, Pamphylians, Egyptians, Libyans, and, and those of Cyrene, visitors from Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we all hear them speaking in our own language the magnificent acts of God. And they were all astounded and they were perplexed, saying, what could this be? One sneered and said, well, they're just drunk. They're full of new wine. Now you, you count the nations that are there. Those are languages, folks. That was the demonstration of tongues in the New Testament. That's also what's talked about in 1 Corinthians 12 through 14. The languages that they spoke. The term new that is used in Mark 16 and verse 17 that they would speak with new tongues, that term is the Greek word kainos, K-A-I-N-O-S. And it signifies a fresh mode of speaking, not a new language that was previously unknown to the human family. It is a language that was not known to the speaker. One commentator says this. He says, this uh, can only mean that they spoke in language that was not known to the speaker. 
in commentating on this text. In the New Testament, the gift of tongues, friends, was the manifestation of the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12. Now there are several views on the gift of tongues, and we've talked about this tonight, but two major views. The Pentecostal and the Charismatics contend that the gift of tongues constituted a type of heavenly language that consisted of a series of unintelligible sounds unrelated to normal human speech, and we've demonstrated that tonight. That it never was meant to be understood except to angels and to the person that's speaking it. Well, that's a, that's a convenient explanation. It's just not biblical. By way of contrast, others argue that the gift of the tongues was simply the divinely imposed ability to communicate the gospel of Christ in the language of the hearer. So that the speaker, who had not been taught the ordinary educational process of learning the language, could still be effective in the preaching and teaching of God's Word. The human language is supported overwhelmingly by the evidence of the Scripture. And the noted scholars in denominations, friends, on this subject, the ones who are the famous ones, all believe, the ones that are intelligent, all believe, I'm not talking about the TV evangelists, they all believe that this was languages and that what was practiced in the Bible was language. To stay true to the text, they have to. Because the evidence is overwhelming that it's languages. Acts 2 is a prime, prime example that that's the case. In the early New Testament days then, friends, the gift of tongues was possessed by the apostles and some in the early church. Not everybody had them. And those that didn't have them were not less they were not less than, any, than the ones that have them. Not every Christian spoke in tongues. Not every Christian had spiritual gifts. But those who did have them were bound to use them as God told them to. But they were subject and they were able to not do it. These are the only recorded instances in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 10 of the direct operation or the baptismal measure of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, no one today has been baptized by the Holy Spirit. Now, if you think you've been baptized by the Holy Spirit, I want you to call our operators right now and tell us how you were baptized with the Holy Spirit when God only promised it to two groups of people. You have to be an awful old person, and I'd like to meet you if you've been baptized by the Holy Spirit because you're either an apostle or you're from the household of Cornelius. In both cases, I would love to talk to you and get to meet you. But that's just not what's found in the Bible, and you're not one of those people, are you? So Holy Spirit baptism doesn't exist today. Now, short of the two instances I just mentioned, the gift of the Holy Spirit in, in tongues by the laying on of the apostles' hands was given to just a few people in the New Testament churches. Every, every church would have had some spiritual gifts. That's one thing that Paul told the Thessalonians he wanted to be there for and to see them so he could give them some more spiritual gifts. This gift allowed those who possessed it to speak in the, uh, by the Holy Spirit in other tongues or languages. By the way, glossolalia is not a, a term that is used to talk about some heavenly language. It is a term used to talk about languages. There's no reason to think the gift of tongues is anything other than a language because it's spoken of in other passages. Now someone says, well, preacher, what about 1 Corinthians 14, verse 2? Talks there about an unknown tongue in the King James. Well, one of the challenges with the King James is this is one instance of it. King James does have some, some problems, just like all translations do. But this term unknown was inserted. If you notice in your Bible in the King James, it's probably in italics, which means it was something given by the person interpreting to try to make the passage more clear. They were trying. And honestly, you could still keep it in there and it would still be able to, to have meaning. 
But notice, and we're not going to take it out because we don't want you to think, well, you know, you're messing with the King James. No, let's leave it in there. Unknown to who? The word is added by the translators and refers to a language in which the speaker was unskillful. So it was unknown. It was an unknown tongue, unknown to the speaker, but not unknown to everybody. That's not what it's talking about. But look at the flow of the passage, look at the context, look at the language and the, uh, the word within the context. And you'll see that what was talked about, it doesn't really indicate who, what it was unknown, but notice it, that it, it would verify that in other passages where tongues are used, that they were unknown to the speaker. They were known. In Acts 2, the language was spoken to the people and they understood in their own language. But the apostles hadn't studied their language. I doubt if I doubt if Peter had studied Arabic or Egyptian, but he could speak it somehow. The ones who spoke in tongues were to speak a portion of God's will, either a revelation, a knowledge, a prophecy, or a doctrine. Now that was what they were limited to. They were either to speak a revelation, some knowledge from God, some prophecy from God, or some doctrine from God. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 6. All right? And short of that, they weren't to speak. Well, the gift of tongues was not empty words, like we demonstrated. While writing to the Corinthians about spiritual gifts, called, Paul called the gift of tongues a sign, not to the believer, but to the unbeliever. That's in 1 Corinthians 14, 22. Now, if you believe in speaking in tongues and you were asked to demonstrate it, and I've asked several people who say they can speak in tongues to speak them for me. They say, no, you're just tempting me. To which I reply, okay, I don't believe you. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14, 22, that you're supposed to speak those tongues and they are to be things you haven't studied. Authentic Bible tongues. You're supposed to be able to speak those things and tell me what you're saying. Somebody is. And if you're saying what God's Word says anyway, what's the purpose for a tongue today? What could the use of a tongue do for me or to me that God's Word does not do in me? For Christians to speak to unbelievers in the unbelievers' native tongues, never having learned it like was done on Pentecost, now that's tongue speaking, folks. But the things we've talked about tonight, that's just phrases put together. And my phrases are as good as yours are. And they're not by some miracle that we got them. So the ones that had the gift of, of uh, tongues could speak tongues they hadn't studied. Now, in 1 Corinthians 14, verses 27 through 40, the church is told, and this is touching on another subject, the church is told to do the things that they do, even the spiritual gifts they have that are authentic from God. They are limited in how, how they can use them. They're only supposed to have two or three, at most three people that speak, and then they have to have an interpreter or they don't any of them speak. And women who had spiritual gifts, and there were women who had some, they were told to be quiet in the assembly. Even though they had the same gift as the man did. And even if they had an interpreter that could tell you what they said, they were told to be quiet. Now friend, let me ask you this. I know I'm getting out there in dangerous territory. But women are not supposed to be speaking in the assembly, especially not in pulpits. They're not supposed to be speaking out in the assembly. Now that's when the whole church has come together. They're not supposed to be yelling out this and yelling out that. It's disorderly. It's not according to the order of Scripture. And the women are told to be silent in the assembly. And men are not to encourage them to speak out in the assembly. Because that's not in order. That's a violation of 1 Corinthians 14, 27 through 40. All right? So they were regulated. And remember that men were told to be quiet too in 1 Corinthians 14 if they didn't have an interpreter. 
Now these gifts have ended. Christians do not have the spiritual gift of tongues today. Paul informed the Corinthians, whether there be prophecies, they'll fail. Tongues, they shall cease. Knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part or fraction, we prophesy in fraction or part, but when that which is perfect, that, that is not Jesus, that it's, is what is perfect, what's referred to before, then that which is in part shall be done away. So what is the perfect? It's the completed will of God today. So spiritual gifts, including the gift of tongues, have ended. But faith, hope, and love are still there, folks. Faith, hope, and love are still there. We need, to, we need to stress that, don't we? People get all wadded up on talking about tongues and this, that, and the other, and I can do this, and I can do what I want to. No, no. The spirit of the prophet subject to the prophet. You ever heard people say, well, I've got the gift of tongues, and I just got to use them? No, no, no. You don't have to use them. You don't have to talk. He says, be quiet. That means you have control, don't you? So, or is the disorderliness in many of these assemblies that you go to, the charismatic groups, is that of God? Now, there's two reasons why people think that they can speak in tongues today or think they have received the gift of tongues. One is that they've been fooled by people, and they're honest people, who've just been fooled. That can happen. You ever been fooled? You ever bought a bad car? You thought it was nice, only to find out it had sand in the radiator, you know? They're betrayed by their own misunderstanding of the Scripture, or their own emotionalism and feeling religion. Your feelings can get you in trouble, people. But the Word of God won't. So again, comparing the gift of tongues as taught in the Bible with what's practiced today, they are nowhere near the same. Okay? Nowhere near. The gift of tongues was a language spoken and understood by men. Those who claim that they can speak in tongues today are not speaking the things that God gives. So, our time's over. Tune in on the first and third Tuesday of each month at 8 p.m. as we study more of God's Word. And we want you to know that this program is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ, meeting at 656 St. James Church Road in Newton, North Carolina. And you would be our friend if you would come and avail yourself of the worship of faithful brethren in your area, wherever they may be. We invite you again to the services of the Newton Church of Christ. You can contact them by uh, mail at P.O. Box 893. And if you want that track we have tonight, you just write us, you get on the website, tell us you want it, or there is still some time to call if you would like to. But thank you again for your time this evening. You've been very gracious to have us in your home, and it's been a privilege and a delight to be with you and discuss these things from God's Word on a very difficult subject. Thank you, and good evening. Have a good week.